Greetings and welcome to Physiological Psychology. My name is Ben and I will be here with you as we go through our introduction today. Our overview looks like this, right? the purpose of our course. What are we doing? All right. Well, this is brain and behavior, which is a incredibly interesting topic. And the goal is to understand what's happening inside our physical brain when we're having an experience or doing something. So we look at our topics. Neuroanatomy is a big one, which means know the brain well. We also consider the everything that's happening in it, and we'll go through the major topics. Now this is an introductory level course, but there is the expectation of completing introduction to psychology and having some basic understanding of the brain and how psychology works. Our major topics really are going to cover pretty much everything in the realm of what's happening in, in the brain. And we look at different aspects. The way we're going to set this up is by looking at the lobes, by looking at the anatomy itself, diving into individual things. We start off with neurons and synapses and go through it that way. This actually presents a really interesting challenge because this class, the way that, that we do it, covers uh, and can count for both a psychology credit or and a biology credit in terms of transfer to the UC system, which means you choose which one it is. I don't think it can count for both, but I think you get to decide in that regard. That means there's a lot of stuff to cover, and that's the challenge. How do we maintain both kind of like the life science aspect and the psychology aspect? And you'll kind of see how that is. That also means there's going to be a lot of material and we'll try to make this as understandable and clear as possible. But there may be times that you likely have to rewatch a video, um, you know, review the material and, and dive in pretty deep. There's a component of this that's not required, but maybe, you know, eventually should be. And this is the lab. There is an optional lab. And in that lab, you will get the chance to do hands-on experiments using tools like EEG. That's all the little electrodes you put on the head. You've seen those caps. Um, looking at the facial muscles. Uh, GSR is the thing used in lie detectors, uh, galvanic skin response. And nerve conduction, basically measuring how long does it take for your nerve to send information. So some really interesting things you'll get to do exploring the senses and exploring how we do neuroscience in that lab, and I encourage you to strongly consider that. The textbook for this class is a combination of things. So in order to keep it without cost to you, um, I've gone through uh, two interesting sources. One is Brain Facts, which is an advanced, um, I believe, like upper level high school Book. So basically students who are competing in neuroscience, which means it's definitely advanced. <laughs> and then we have the open sacs anatomy and physiology, which is generally for people who are going, you know, really heavily into some of the life sciences. And we're going to be using one of, I think there's five sections in the book. We're going to be using the one that you, looks at the nervous system. So we're going to combine these things together. Some of the chapters, you know, some of the sections, I should say, will contain both uh, OpenStax and the Brain Facts book. Some may just contain one or the other. And in a couple of areas, I have supplemented this with research papers that are kind of these really nice combinations of uh, analyses of research. So these are generally what would be considered to be literature review papers where they take a lot of research and explain it to you, and we'll be using that. So I mentioned why we're using, you know, these texts. And also, you're going to notice in the presentation, I'll be asking some questions. I'll actually have some slides in there that are multiple choice questions that I think, you know, we use this in class, and I think this is really helpful in terms of making sure we're aware of what's going on and paying attention and testing ourselves. 
And there's a lot of good research behind this, and I'll show you that in a moment after I show you how to get these texts. Now remember, these textbooks are free. So if somebody is asking you to pay for them, you're on the wrong site. And we're gonna have the readings very specifically laid out in the syllabus that tells you for each section what reading is gonna help you. And as usual, I'm gonna say, please read this first. And as usual, many students are gonna say, yeah, 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 I'll read it when I get to it, or, or not at all. So here is kind of how it, how it works. Now this is from brainfacts.org. And you see those little lines up here in the corner. This is telling you how to find this, uh, this text. And if we look here, once we click on the little buttons, we see the Brain Facts book. And then we, you can follow the instructions to download the copy of that for free. Anatomy and Physiology. This is from openstacks.org. And you can see the link here. And if you just were to type it into a search engine, you can find it the same way. OpenStax Anatomy and Physiology will come up easily. You can download a PDF. You can also order hard copies of these texts. So if you prefer to read an actual book, you can order them. And they're rather inexpensive. You're basically paying for the cost of printing these things. So I'm grateful to the creators of these texts uh, based, who, who are looking for ways to, you know, the same, same thing I am, keep the costs low for you. Now I'm your instructor and a few things about me. I got my doctorate from UCI. Uh, I got my bachelor's from Florida Atlantic University and I started out at Palm Beach Community College where a lot of people start out in various community colleges. It was a great experience. I got to take lots of different classes and I encourage you to consider that too. Explore different things. I changed my major I think only once at that point, maybe twice. And it's a good way to kind of see what you like. I teach a lot of different classes, uh, including intro psych, physio psych, the lab, developmental psych, cognition, um, statistics, language acquisition, and then some advanced research, independent directed research classes. It's a really cool to, to get involved in. And a few quick notes. Um, you know, Makeup assignments are only given in exceptional circumstances. So when it comes to the class itself, make sure that you're keeping up with things and putting turning things in on time. It is not good to get behind. Make sure that you're aware of how to write papers, uh, paraphrase and cite. Always paraphrase, put it in your own words and cite. The plagiarism detectors are going to call up anything that's questionable. And then you lose a whole grade and you get you know referred to the dean for something that is really, it's not hard to put it in your own words and cite it. Quotes are generally bad because they just say, hey, I can cut and paste. Paraphrasing says, here, I, I have a fairly good understanding of what this means. Now, what about these colored index cards? Well, the reason for using them has to do with improving learning. So I might show you a question like this. Why does Ben want you to use colored index cards? And you would, in class, hold up the color. And for our purposes here, you can simply say what the answer is. When we look at why we do this, here is actual research on clickers. You know, those little things in class where they put it up and you click in and it shows up on the screen. Same concept. And you'll see a pretty big jump in learning. When some things are reviewed with a clicker, you will actually perform better on that material on future tests, which means this kind of reinforcement is helping you to put that more permanently into your memory, which is great. Because when we pull something out of our memory, we're doing something different than when we're putting something into our memory. Basic questions. What are you getting into? How much work is this class? The answer is, it depends on what grade you want to get. Now, there's a lot of material, right? Which means you're gonna have to know areas of the brain and what they do. And that's the goal. If you keep the focus on functional anatomy, what's happening in the brain right now when we're watching a video, when we're thinking about material, right? Well, your visual system's engaged, your auditory you know, uh, perception is working, and you're thinking about it. So we can actually link where in the brain this function is happening, which to me sounds awesome, 
And if we can remember to keep things in those terms, we should be okay at, at doing this. In addition, what's happening in our brains when we're experiencing things is probably the most complex of all human questions and a lot of areas we may not have answers to. Missing things, you can always, you know, make up watching things, but you don't want to miss things that are due. Quizzes, assignments, things with really specific due dates are very important to keep track of. And I think this could very well be one of the best things, the best classes you take. But again, it depends on what you put in. Are you going to get your money's worth? Absolutely. As long as you allow it to happen by doing the work, keeping up with the material. So in our very first week, let's answer some pretty big questions. What is physiological psychology? What do we study? And why are we talking about genes? Well, I mentioned functional anatomy is a big key, but the brain itself is made up of neurons. And so neurons and glia, these, what were traditionally thought of as support cells for neurons, but actually do a lot of really interesting things on their own, including being big areas of research today where people will really focus and study on specific types of glial cells, right? In terms of how are they helping the brain function? So we need to understand neurons too, and we'll be doing that very soon. So in understanding neurons, we need to understand how neurons can change. And understanding how neurons change means understanding genes. Physiological psychology has other names. And so when someone asks you what class you're taking, you can really say any of these things, biopsych, psychobio, behavioral neuroscience, whatever you think makes it sound the most interesting. Their definition is a branch of psychology that deals with the effects of normal and pathological physiological processes on mental life. That's a lot to unpackage. The idea is your mind and your brain are somehow connected. Your mind is your sense of self, of focus, of attention. But it's all being produced in some way by the meat of the brain. So we'll be looking at, oh yeah, what are you experiencing? But what's it connected to in the brain? So the link between the brain and behavior. If I were to ask you what you remember from intro, can you name the four main lobes of the brain? Well, they're in different colors here on this image. We see the frontal lobe in blue, the parietal lobe in yellow, the temporal lobe in green, and the occipital lobe in red. How about the parts of the neuron? What are the two main components that are really unique to the neuron itself? Right, that would be what? The dendrites and the axon. Now there's other things too, but that's what we think about it, the main things. Well, did that come easily to mind? If those things came easily to mind, you're probably fairly well prepared for this kind of thing. If not, you might want to go back and look at the really intro level material here to make sure you know. Neuroscience. We are in what I would call the golden age of neuroscience, and it just keeps getting better. If you want a career where you're always going to have problems to figure out neuroscience, we are learning so much about the brain, and we still have so far to go that it's this beautiful and ripe area of investigation. For most of our history, you know, uh, we couldn't look inside the brain. And we didn't know what it was. If you recall what the Egyptians did, right, when they mummified people, they sucked out the brain. The brain was wet. If you left it in there, it was going to rot. And where do you feel things? You know, they thought the sense of the seat of consciousness, the seat of self was, was in your heart, which makes total sense if you're living 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, right? When you're excited, what happens? Your heart starts pounding. Your brain doesn't do anything. Right? When you're in love, you feel it. When you're afraid, when you um, are, are, are hurting, you feel it in your heart, in your gut, physically. But you don't feel it here. It wasn't until the 18th century that we really started to investigate things. And Gaul, Franz Gaul, was famous for the phrenology. If you see the image here, it's, you know, where are these areas where you do these things? Now, this is all nonsense, but it was a cool idea. Right, so Gall's idea was this. When you use part of your brain, it 
gets stronger. It grows, which we know things do change. Gall thought that you could actually see this by, you know, by feeling the skull and saying, oh, look, they have a, a bump here. They're going to be a criminal, right? Which is the part that doesn't make any sense, right? That we know that's not true. But it was a cool idea. Phrenology was that study of the skull shape and the idea that it linked to underlying function. Well, we do similar things now, right? By looking at the brain and linking them to underlying function. So Gall, we can make fun of phrenology, but the guy really was ahead of his time in some, in, in some interesting ways. Uh, Florens pioneered what's called the ablation method, which was, you know, you look at animals and you basically cut out parts of the brain and see what happens. Now, we can't do science this way today. That's terrible. If you, just, you can't just open an animal's head and start slicing and dicing with a scalpel. But in the 18th and 19th century, there were no IRBs or rules, and we didn't know much, and Florence really brought some really interesting ideas to the table. We also, around this time, saw the Phineas Gage accident. That is the gentleman holding that tamping rod there. He worked on the railroad. He used the rod to pound the explosives into a hole in the ground, and the explosives went off, shooting the rod through his skull, under his chin, out the top, taking out his eye and damaging his frontal lobe. Now, Phineas Gage has long been used as an example of, oh, he frontal lobe was destroyed, he became an alcoholic, his life was a mess, which is kind of true. But they always leave out the part that at the end of his life, he moved to South America and got a job driving coaches. He didn't live a full life. He still died fairly young. But he was able to cope, even with that kind of damage, which is really quite interesting. But he's always used as an example of, hey, look, if we damage this part of the brain, this happens. You can't do ablation in humans. You can't just cut out parts of human brain to see what happens. That's horrific. Around the time of Gage, you had Broca and Warnicke, who were also studying, really, Gall's ideas. They were looking for, in the brain, could we see this? And Broca's famous patient, Pam, had a stroke and could only say one word or two words. And he just couldn't speak very well. When he died, Broca looked at his brain and saw that a big area of his brain was damaged. And Broca took that to mean, well, this guy could still understand, but he couldn't produce language. So language production is there. Wernicke's patient couldn't understand. He could produce language, but didn't make any sense. And that's how we got Wernicke's area. So we started to get in and see, okay, there's some brain areas that seem to be doing very specific things. The first human EEG was in 1924. Very, very broad, but that's the image here with the cap on the guy's head. The brain was ignored through a great part of the 20th century, up until about the 1950s mostly because we couldn't look inside. And the behaviorists made a really good argument that, why should we? Why don't we just look at what's actually happening? We look at the environment and we look at your behavior and we see how you act based on the stimuli. Cool ideas, a lot of it worked. And it didn't really fall out of favor until cognitive psychology and neuroscience really started to take off in the 60s. The first patient brain CT scan was 1971, another huge boost to neuroscience. A CT scan is basically an x-ray of the brain. They take slices. They look at different parts of the brain to see what's happening. If someone has a stroke, for instance, you can see exactly where it is. You couldn't do that before in a living patient, which originally allowed for the idea of, hey, we can treat this person better by knowing what's going on, but it also linked to neuropsychology. Uh, now we're looking at the ability to give people tests. So you're giving people these functional tests and seeing where in the brain they have damage. Well, now you can link, hey, they can't do this anymore. They had a stroke, let's say, in their inferior parietal lobe on the left side, and here's the results of these tests. This area must be for this. That is where a lot of our knowledge comes from right? Where in the brain is there dysfunction? What does it look like? The first bold contrast fMRI studies in humans were in 1992. And I really don't trust a lot of fMRI data from before the mid to late 2000, uh, 2000 simply because 
the, the sample sizes were small. In the beginning, MRI was, fMRI was very expensive. And they had small sample sizes, leading to some questionable results. Today, fMRI is probably would be considered the gold standard in terms of what we're doing, right? Being able to look inside the brain at what's happening at a second-to-second -second basis while you're doing something, while you're viewing different stimuli or answering questions or thinking about something or hearing sounds to see the live action effectively of the brain. And that's really where we get into this time we are now and why this is so cool. Now, why do we care about the brain? Well, David Chalmers is a philosopher who kind of coined these two different ideas, the hard problem of consciousness and the easy problem of consciousness. And the hard problem of consciousness is the idea of why are we conscious? You know, why do you have a sense of self? Why do you believe that you have these the hopes and dreams and experiences. What's it like to be you, right? Why is it? We don't need it to survive. We really don't need this consciousness. We could be just fine without it. And then we have different ways of viewing the world. Some philosophers say there's no consciousness, only the physical world. Consciousness is an illusion. It's a story we tell ourselves. And then there's others that say there's no physical world. It's only consciousness. Well, we know to a certain extent that what we experience isn't true. We know that our dogs have better senses of smell, that birds can see more colors, and that sharks can detect the size of you, can figure out how big you are by sensing the size of your magnetic field that your body produces. Snakes can see in the complete dark by using heat information in order to find prey. So we clearly don't see reality. We don't see all aspects of the physical world. So it's an interesting discussion. We call this the mind-body or mind-brain problem. What is the link between the brain and the mind? And everything we learn could be wrong. But we're going to focus on that easy problem of consciousness, which is what is happening in the brain when you're experiencing something? What are you experiencing and what is your brain doing? fMRI, EEG, great tools for this. Whatever you believe in about the nature of the world, we can clearly see in many of these studies, right, when we look at the brain, neuroimaging, if we change the characteristics of a stimuli, you change your experience. Your brain changes what it's doing. So we can see some kind of link, whatever that is. And our focus is brain function. Now here's a nice big overview of the brain. We see more areas than before, right? So we're looking at Again, the general, the reddishes, reddish colors are our frontal lobe. The blues are parietal. The green are occipital. And this orangey yellows, that's our temporal lobe. Now, we look at our temporal lobe being focused on hearing. Our frontal lobe being focused on motor and thinking. Our parietal lobe being focused on senses right? Sensory feedback and things like navigation in space. And our visual areas, our occipital lobe being dedicated to vision. The biggest things our brain do being vision and language, because language pulls in from auditory and movement in all of these, in you know, thinking and all these things. So we look at these key areas. In the frontal lobe, we've got the primary motor cortex. In the parietal lobe, the primary sensory cortex our auditory cortex, and we see, remember Broca and Wernicke, near or in the temporal lobe, right along that line that divides the frontal from the temporal, right? That's called the sylvian fissure, and it, uh, right along it is where we see hearing and language kind of centered. Some terms to consider. We are looking top-down at the brain here, right? We're on the left, we're looking at the top of the brain. On the right, we're looking at the bottom of the brain. The top view is called the dorsal view, right? The top being kind of like a dorsal fin on a dolphin, the dorsal view. The bottom being the ventral view, the ventral, right? From the means belly. And we're looking at things that look quite different. You want to get either a 3D model or a physical model that you can turn and manipulate and look at and see what it looks like. 
In the dorsal view, we see the pink being our frontal lobe, the green being our parietal, and the blue being our occipital. When we look at where things are in terms of some more language, medial means toward the middle, right? So something midline is medial. Lateral means toward the edges, right? Toward the side. And so we use these terms to tell us where things are in the brain. And the terms that we're learning are going to give us that. And we're going to learn more about them when we talk about anatomy. Now, I mentioned the frontal is the pink, but it's also, we can see it on the ventral view in the front. The parietal, and, and the front being the top of the image, the top of the image representing the front of each image, it's the front of the brain. On our ventral view at the bottom, right, the lowest, it's a little hard to see, this is our spinal cord, right, the connection from the brain to the rest of our body, our cerebellum here, and we can see our temporal lobe, but in our dorsal view, we can't see our temporal lobe. In our ventral view, we can't see our parietal lobe. So we get an idea of what these things look like, of what these, you know, give us, and how we can view them. And you'll notice a lot of things happening when we look at the bottom of the brain. These are those deep brain structures. And we look at what separates us from animals, from lizards, from you know, early mammals, it's the huge cortex that we have, the size of this cortex. This bottom part, shared across species. When we look at some more terms, I mentioned we have dorsal, the top, ventral, belly. We also have superior, posterior, inferior, and anterior. The frontal lobe is anterior to the parietal lobe. Right? It's just a way of saying in front of, anterior. The occipital lobe is posterior to the temporal lobe. Right? The parietal lobe is superior to the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is inferior to the parietal lobe. That all makes sense. You're looking at it going, okay, we can see what these things, that's the terminology we use. And we'll, when we look at a brain, we say, okay, now inferior to this is this. And it helps us to locate and understand things. A brief overview of our neurons. Well, when we're describing the, the small units, we're talking about neurons and glia. Now, there's also blood vessels throughout our brain. And that's an interesting thing, too, because when you actually start, you know, if you look at slice away, sometimes you'll come across things and you're like, it's actually looking at a blood vessel or a blood cell inside a vessel which we're kind of like not really considering. So we're looking, okay, where's the neurons, where's the glia? Finding your way around can be a little tricky. We look, for instance, at this image on the left. This is brain tissue. What we're looking at here are spindle neurons and what they look like in tissue. Very difficult to see. We're looking at a very thin slice. If you image them individually, now on the right, we see what the neurons look like, these spindle neurons. And I'm using spindle neurons because they look kind of like the traditional neurons. Now at the bottom of this, we have our dendrites. And at the top of them, we have these axons going out. When we look at the image on our left, can we see dendrites and axons? It's a mess because, again, we're looking at a single plane, and neurons are spreading in multiple dimensions, which means they're very difficult to see in tissue unless you happen to get one that just is laying fairly flat. And there's some cells that do that. This is our multipolar motor neuron, where we have at the top our dendrites and at the bottom our axon. Notice the axon splits. And again, we're looking at it on the right. We see what that looks like. And we also can see little dots that represent support cells. We can also see so that the neurons are in here. This stuff is muscle, muscle tissue right, the rest of it. So that's what we're looking at here. And another difference between these are, on the left, we see a neuron that is unmyelinated. On the right, we see myelination. These would be like the multipolar uh, motor, uh, motor neurons we just saw, where at the top we have the dendrites, and then the output is this nice long axon moving down. 
Well, on the left you have no myelin, and on the right you do. And so what is this stuff? Well, this is what insulates neurons, and some neurons have myelin, which allows them to conserve energy and speed the rate of transmission. When the neuron fires, fires, right, transmits a signal from you know, the cell body to the end of the axon, it has to go down the entire neuron. Myelinated neurons allow this conduction to jump, and we'll get into that basically from the open areas here, and that saves time and energy. We also have to consider how neurons are going to change, because it's a big area in the first, in the beginning of our, of our discussion, because remember, the brain is changing. If you learn something today, if it stays in your memory, it means that your neurons have to physically change in order to store that information. Now, how they change, many ways this can happen, but this is gonna require physiological changes, which is gonna be brought about by genes, some kind of genetic effect. And both genes and the environment interact to shape our behavior. Everything we do that's complex is a combination of these things. Interplay of nature and nurture. And these are complex things. You know, there's no one gene that makes you depressed or one gene that gives you a weight issue or one gene for personality or even one gene for who you're attracted to. These are very complex. So we talk about genes, we consider DNA and RNA and how they work. Many of, this you might, of these things you might remember. This might bring you back to something like sixth grade biology. I think that's where I heard about these things. And we got our 19th century monk, Gregor Mendel, whose work was forgotten until people were looking for a mechanism to explain Darwin's natural selection. <clears throat> and we see that you're looking at how genes work. And Mendel realized that each of these, for instance, uh, purple flowers or white flowers would each contribute some information. And you have these terms of heterozygous and homozygous. Heterozygous meaning for each gene a person has an unmatched pair of genes. And our purple flowers, right, on the top and on the left are each heterozygous. They have the gene for purple, the dominant gene, and the gene for white, the recessive gene, right? The dominant gene being represented by the capital B, the recessive gene being represented by the lowercase b. So, if you have two heterozygous flowers that cross-pollinate, their offspring will be this combination in this Punnett square here of one, that gets both of the dominant genes from the parents, two, they get one dominant and one recessive gene, and one that gets two recessive genes, and then you have the white offspring. We classically see this with eye color, right? Human eye color being, you know, brown versus blue. It's more complex than this, but generally, this is why if you have blue eyes and your partner has blue eyes, your offspring have to have blue eyes generally. If you have brown eyes and your partner has brown eyes, the, it depends. It depends on whether or not you're homozygous or heterozygous for that trait. If you have, you know, the ability to, or the, the genes there. Now, we, these dominant genes, if you have one copy of the dominant genes, that's the outcome. So Huntington's disease is a, um, dominant gene condition. If you have one of these genes, you are going to get Huntington's disease as you age. And so if you have it and you have children, your offspring have a 50% chance of having this disease. Friedrich's ataxia, however, is a recessive gene, which means you need two copies. And an ataxia is a movement disorder. We talk about this in physiological psychology. So if you have this, you're getting one of these genes from each of your parents. Incomplete dominance is something like hazel eye color. Neither gene is dominant, but you have a new trait. And codominance is when you have two genes that are both expressed. If you know your blood type, right? Uh, you've got basically, you've heard of A, B, and O are the major types. And if you have a parent, you can basically get, you can have A, B, O or AB. And there's a number of ways these things can happen. 
So if you have one A gene from one parent and one B gene from the other, you have AB blood. In order to have O, you have to have two O's. To have A or B, you can have one A and an O, one B and an O, or two B's or two A's for those. So you get the idea. Uh, this is generally a good thing. Having multiple types of genes is generally good because it allows adaptation to happen. So when we think about what that is, it means we can adapt to different environments we can more quickly if we have variability. This was part of Darwin's idea. Variability allows adaptation of a species to an environment to happen more quickly because there's different kind of genes that may in, you know, be, more, be related to fitness. What happens when you kind of go outside of this? Well, there's this famous case of the Habsburg empires, right? So they had this huge family, the Habsburgs, in Europe, in the, um, you know, uh, 15 and 1600s, and you ended up with King Charles II of Spain. And these red lines here represent uncle, niece, first cousin, and second cousin pairings. And you ended up with these very distinct traits Right, you see right away here, okay, here's the grandparents at the very top. And then you see, for instance, okay, each of their children had to marry somebody. And then you started to get a lot of interbreeding, right, where the royal families. Well, you ended up with, you know, poor Charles II, who had an enormous misshapen head, uh, a jaw that made it impossible for him to close his mouth and chew, a large tongue where he couldn't speak. Basically, he went from, they, they describe him going from infancy to senility. We would call this today severe developmental disorders. Um, and his family basically was, was wildly um, inbred, right? So what you end up with is these recessive genes building up. And you end up with these traits that aren't, going to happen in a wider environment. Generally, the more genetic diversity we have, the healthier we are, the stronger our immune systems, right? The better our fitness. So we've got two main classes of genes. These are generally sex-linked sex linked and autosomal, where most of them are not sex-linked. What's interesting about these is when we're talking about these, the X chromosome is a much more robust Gene. Basically, you have 1,500 proteins coded for on X. So again, what do genes do? They code for proteins. The Y chromosome codes for 27. So if you have two X chromosomes, if you're female, and one has something off, cool. You have another one. If you're male, that's it. So colorblindness is much more common in males than females because... Males, if you have the gene that's missing or mutated, that's it, right? Um, if you're female, you kind of have a backup copy. So genes vary in, in general, these several ways. Mutation can happen. Um, you have something you just randomly have. And, and again, all of us have this. Most of us, you know, we generally have a, a number of, of mutations in our genes that don't exist in our uh, our parents. The most uh, fertilized zygotes don't implant for various reasons, and many are spontaneously aborted. So any kind of combination of genes that is non-viable, we simply won't see. So these mutations that happen in us, they're simply random changes that have no effect or very little effect on us in most cases. Rarely will you have a genetic change that is so great that it passes through the entire population and it's theorized that has happened in our human history. We have microduplication and microdeletions. Well, you can have, in this case, certain syndromes are related to extra copies or deletions that can cause changes in the outcome. You add another codon, another uh, you know, letter to your DNA, and it can change everything. It can change the whole protein and make you unable to function, having severe disorders or something like that. So this is how these things change. And then with, you know, sexual reproduction, 
having a copy from each parent causes other genetic combinations. Proteins. Well, you've heard of gene therapy, right? Oh, we're, we're going to fix your genes by changing them. Well, this was a cool idea. People were excited about it in the 1980s, 1990s, and it never happened. It's really hard to do. Genes produce proteins. That's their purpose, is to produce proteins. And proteins then give us everything else. They can give us our hormones. They can create our, our entire physical structure. Genes code for proteins, right? You know those adorable little ribosomes in your cells? Their job is to make proteins. You get a, you know, DNA from your nucleus of the cell. It gets copied into RNA. RNA leaves the cell, finds a ribosome, makes a protein. So here we're going to eventually come, come all around and say, hey, you want to change a neuron? Make a protein. How do you do that? DNA, which means you got to give some kind of signal there. All right, CRISPR. CRISPR is a technique you've seen in the news where they are able to make changes by taking a uh, cell envelope that is able to pass through a cell wall and make changes to the DNA, right? They're able to put something in to change the DNA itself. This is awesome. It's fancy. It's hard. You can use it to uh, avoid certain genetic issues if two parents have some gene issues in offspring. It has a hard time doing long-term changes to you, for instance, if you wanted to like do gene therapy. And the reason is it doesn't last forever. It's not like you can inject one copy of this and it's going to change all your DNA, right? It kind of doesn't make it that far. So the solution probably lies in proteins because genes don't do things themselves. And when you're trying to treat genetic disorders, you're looking at proteins. So we got DNA, the gene, to mRNA, messenger RNA, that leaves the cell protein, and the protein leads to the functions. And proteins can form part of tissue, enzymes, hormones, all these things, transporters, protein channels. And there it is. You stick a protein channel into a neuron, you change the function of the neuron. And now we're storing information. The brain is changing. The learning thing is changing. This is called plasticity. Plasticity means the brain is adaptable, right? Throughout your entire life, even into old age, you can learn new things. And there's a lot of information, there's a lot of evidence that says, Learn things, it's good for you. The more, the harder it is to learn things, the more interesting, the better it is for you. The better you are health-wise, cognitive as you age. So, there's our protein channels, which are ion channels, many of them, right? Which means ions like sodium, potassium, moving in and out of the neuron all the time. You add a channel, you take a channel away, you change the flow. You change how fast the neuron can fire. You change the information that gets sent. And new information is now there. Now, how do we get in there? Epigenetics is this term used for change, right? So basically, genetics is you have a genetic code. Epigenetics refers to, in a way, what gets turned on. So different genes get turned on at different times. And how they do that is by sending a messenger into the nucleus, which causes some of these chromosomes to unravel, right? They're held in these histone molecules, which then the DNA is wrapped around it, and something causes it to let go. And when you expose it, it gets copied. Once it gets copied, it goes and does something. Right, so this epigenetic factor here, right, is causing, hey, let's release this strand of DNA here, and now let's copy it, and now we have new proteins. And we see here a little close-up. Something goes in, causes the exposure, and this is a chemical signal. Now, we'll talk about this when we talk about how neurons fire and the signals they send specifically at the synapse. So that's a little ways away. The idea is this, synapses, going from one neuron to the other, there's a space called the synapse that has to get crossed by neurotransmitters. 
synapses can do different things. Some can say, fire, make this neuron fire right now. Some can say, don't fire, don't do anything. Some can say, make some changes, which means they're actually creating this other process, this Rube Goldberg machine, where one thing is going to another, like in an OK Go video. And this one protein is released, which causes another you know, protein to do something else, and then it makes it into the nucleus, causing this to copy and go change the neuron. Uh, causing the neuron to fire, cool, over and done. Making a neuron change, that's a big deal. Neurons fire all the time. Move my hand. Neurons have to fire in order for me to use the muscles to flex and extend my fingers. But they're not changing. They're simply doing something. Now think about memory. Now think about learning and adaptation. Something has to physically change in your brain to make this happen. This copied DNA can leave the nucleus and go do something. And we go back to our ribosomes. The ribosomes that could be in our endoplasmic reticulum or just in your uh, cytoplasm itself that now copy. And this happens rapidly with your building blocks of your proteins, right? Your amino acids that are getting pulled in and attached together and then folding into the proteins themselves. So epigenetics is where we care about how genes are expressed, what genes get turned on. Things like puberty, right, where all of a sudden you go from a well-behaved 11-year-old to a nightmarish, moody 13-year-old, right? What happened? Epigenetics. Something caused a whole bunch of genes to get turned on, right? Then we also look at other things. If you're going to have something like PTSD, right, epigenetics, something's causing a change in your brain very rapidly. And then we have genes that change over the course of the day. Genes that get turned on and off based on how much light is outside, right? How much light is being perceived by your eye, sending a signal to your brain telling you if it's daytime or nighttime, and what kind of hormones to manufacture. Epigenetics is even more interesting. Epigenetics is why grasshoppers and locusts, specifically the desert locusts of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, and the grasshopper is the same species and the same individual. Basically, you've got these incredibly uh, large swings in the environment causing change. When there's so many grasshoppers that they're competing, it causes a spike in serotonin levels. The serotonin will cause their legs and wings to shrink, their colors to change, and their brains get bigger. And their brains have to get bigger because now they are no longer solitary, they are social. And if they go too slow, they're going to get eaten by the locust behind them. And they consume everything. But this is part of the life cycle of the species. They look different. They behave different. Their bodies physiologically change. Their behavior changes. Same species, same individual. That's epigenetics. Epigenetics is genes getting turned on that cause changes. And it's happening right now in your brain. Genes are getting turned on and causing changes. You're looking at the word epigenetics. Am I going to remember that word? How am I going to remember that word? Oh, cool story about the grasshoppers and locusts. It's going to get in there. Brain has to change. Now, nature and nurture. Everything has this heredity, this environment. It's just nature and nurture. The oldest debates in science and philosophy. How much of you is your genes? How much of you is your upbringing? Right? And what is the combination of these influences? And the answer is it's always a combination. We are genetically more alike than unalike. We are more similar than dissimilar. Yet, we all have our own genes, and there's still variability between us. 
How do we study this? Look at monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic are your identical twins. Dizygotic are effectively siblings raised in the same womb that have a very similar upbringing. We're able to see how much of our contributions are nature and how much are nurture. We look at different traits and what's called their heritability. How much these characteristics depend on genetic differences? And researchers have found evidence for heritability in everything. And there's these strong environmental influences, which are going to cause certain genetic influences to have less of an effect. You may have a predisposition for depression or some other mental illness, but will you have it? Well, it depends. It depends on the environment. We look at what's your environment. What are your pressures? And how are these things influencing your genes that may or may not get turned on? Genes do not produce behaviors. They create proteins that change the probability of behaviors. Hormones. You boost testosterone levels to create to increase aggression. You boost serotonin levels to decrease aggression. In the cat in the grasshopper, the serotonin causes a massive physiological change. Which means when we think of serotonin, usually we think of depression. And we'll come back to this. But in the grasshopper, it changes them physiologically, which means it's a much more interesting issue than that. Our neurotransmitters are much more interesting. So we have an effect. As soon as you were old enough to influence your environment, you were having an effect on your neurophysiology due to environment influencing the genes that get turned on. Well, that is it for our first segment here. Thank you, and I look forward to our next one.